We're back for your ears only. I'm David Alpern. I'm Eddie Robinson with this quote from the news. Corruption virus, Anna antivirus. That was a handwritten poster waved by one of more than 10,000 peaceful protesters in New Delhi supporting jailed social activist Anna Hazare, who subsequently negotiated his release for another 15 days of his hunger strike and additional demonstrations for a strong new anti-corruption initiative. Now this. For the sake of the Syrian people, the time has come for him to step aside and leave this transition to the Syrians themselves. As defiant protest and deadly suppression continue in Syria, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton echoed President Obama in the first actual U.S. call for President Bashar Assad to resign. But to call the violence there a transition implies some clear alternative to years of despotic rule, which hardly exists in that country, or in embattled Libya and Yemen. To talk about the ambiguous situation in those countries, continuing violence in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, for your ears only, we're joined again by Jean-Pierre Filiou, a professor of Middle East Studies at the Paris Institute of Political Studies, or Sciences Po. His new book is The Arab Revolution, Ten Lessons from the Democratic Uprising from Hearst & Company, Limited London. Welcome back to our program. Thank you very much for having me again. Let's start with Syria, Professor. What impact do you see from the call for Bashar to step aside from the U.S. and several European allies and from an array of escalating sanctions against Syrian trade and resources? Well, it was a much-expected move, especially by the Syrian people, because they have been calling for this kind of escalation of sanctions. The last Friday of protest was protest against international silence. So they, of course are um, quite enthusiastic about that, that move, but they also know that everything will have to come from inside Syria, that the key is not outside. It's helping them to become stronger and stronger, but they don't want any kind of direct interference. Given the mix of pro-democracy demonstrators, local tribes, and militias arrayed against the regime, what sort of leadership do you see emerging if Assad should leave? Basically, it will be an inclusive leadership among the different factions, communities, sects, and what is even more important, not only Arab, but including Kurds and other minorities. This inclusiveness is the key of that movement. And how do you see such a transition affecting the region? Uh, the reaction of other leaders facing protests, Syria's ally Iran, and enemy Israel? Iran, at least the regime in Iran, the Islamic Republic, is basically panicked by, by what is happening in Syria, not only because this is the only ally in the region, but because it could give the democratic movement inside Iran revolutionary impulse. In Israel, they seem to prefer, until today, an evil they know and have been living with than the uncertainty of what could happen next. Speaking of Iran, there seems to be a public relations war over a long-standing opposition group called the MEK based in Iraq. Some conservatives say it should be supported to keep pressure on Tehran, uh, but the New York Times last week ran a big story painting it as an unreliable cult. What's your view? Well, the MEK, Mujahideen Echalk, is definitely a cultish organization with a terrorist uh, practice. In fact, it was for many years the stooges of Saddam Hussein, and I'm quite surprised that people on the Hill are still supporting it now against Iran. It really is uh, a non-player, non-partner. Let's move to Libya, where rebel forces captured a key oil refinery and seemed suddenly almost at the gates of Tripoli itself. Just a week ago, there were reports of violent tribal infighting over the assassination of a former Qaddafi general who had become the top rebel military commander. Uh, how unified is the rebel movement really? There certainly is a lot of contradiction inside the rebel movement because, like in Syria, it's inclusive. So you have many shades of uh, insurgents, including defectors from the regime, Islamists, nationalists, liberals, tribals. But what is sure is that after the blow that was the murder of Abdel Fattah Younes, their top military commander, they really put their heart together and they are moving really against Tripoli with uh, the new force. And what directions would the rebels take Libya if Gaddafi carries through with reported secret negotiations for his departure? So far, the insurgency is adamant in its refusal 
to deal with Gaddafi. They want Gaddafi's departure as a precondition for any kind of settlement. But of course, things could happen, for example, in neighboring Tunisia, where there are reports of secret talks to ease that transition, maybe with Saif al-Islam, the son. We don't know yet. All this is, of course, very secret. There's a similar array of tribal, pro-democracy, and Islamist forces in Yemen whose president remained under medical treatment in Saudi Arabia, but whose nominal leadership is protected by large security forces. How long do you think they can hold power in his absence, or do they even name a successor? Well, the deputy president is in fact running and ruling the country in his name. The key question is what would Saudi Arabia do if President Saleh really wants to leave its territory to come back to Sana'a. My guess is that they won't let him go. And probably this is what is happening now already uh, with them, you know, avoiding his return to uh, prepare for a transition in his absence in Sana'a. If the anti-government forces should succeed, what would that mean for Yemen as a continuing base for al-Qaeda-linked terrorists, including the American-born internet cleric Anwar al-Awlaki? In fact, all the dictators, Gaddafi, it's obvious, Bashar al-Assad in a way, and also uh, President Ali Abdullah Saleh of Yemen, are playing the al-Qaeda boogeyman to justify their resilience in power. The reality is that a more open, more democratic system would probably corner the jihadis and could be the beginning of their hand. What was your reaction to the re-escalation of violence in Iraq and Afghanistan as Washington reduces its presence in greater and lesser degrees? Of course, I was very shocked uh, by this uh, string of uh, terror attacks so deadly, so murderous. I don't see a direct connection, but I see the fact that, uh, of course, uh, the opposition, the insurgency, in both instances, try to uh, take uh, uh, the opportunity uh, for imposing their presence in this new context. Jean-Pierre Filiou is professor of Mill East Studies at the Paris Institute of Political Studies, or Sciences Po. His new book is The Arab Revolution, Ten Lessons from the Arab Uprising, from Hearst and Company Limited, London. Quote from the news, this is the price of doing business in Somalia. You're always going to have seepage. That was a humanitarian aid official on reports of wholesale theft and resale of food meant to fight famine by contractors, adding to challenges posed by Islamist militants, gunmen, and disease. Next, restaging a royal romance for your ears only.